Located approximately 24 kilometers from Jamaica's capital city and situated on the southeastern coast of St. Catherine is the largest urban community. This urban settlement is known as Portmore and is the second largest after the capital of Spanish Town. Portmore can be divided into two divisions, the plains to the north and the limestone hills of Elsha to the south. Today, Portmore makes up the municipality of Portmore, from Passage Fort Drive to the north to as far south as Port Anderson Road. Portmore is also one step closer to becoming Jamaica's 15th parish. Its capital will be Portmore, which was the same model used to determine the capital for Kingston, which is also Kingston. The dormitory community is expected to become the first to be granted parish status in Jamaica in 155 years, the last time being in 1867 when St. Thomas was named a parish, absorbing the bulk of the historic parish of St. David at the time. The history of Portmore is one that encompasses a rich and compelling past, a past that can be traced through different groups of people, localities and the time, all of which has made a significant impact on the area that is Portmore today. Early History and Spanish Occupation Portmore's history stretches as far back as 900 AD to the first inhabitants, the Tainos. Evidence of Taino presence has been discovered at Port Anderson Hill, Elsha, and Nagozed. There are also evidence of Spanish occupation in Portmore, Port Anderson, and Elsha, where they had built haciendas. The Spanish claimed to have discovered Jamaica in 1494 and thereafter declared Jamaica a Spanish colony which resulted in the annihilation of the gentle Taino people. Portmore was brought into focus when the Spanish capital was moved from Seville in St. Anne to Spanish Town in St. Catherine. Passage Fort Passage Fort, or the Passage as it has been earlier called because it was the place of embarkation from Spanish Town, for this reason it became one of the island's most important forts. Much like Spanish Town's importance, Passage Fort was equally significant to the Spaniards, however, Passage Fort was not viewed as the finest port of its kind, primarily because of the shallow waters that prevented large ships from docking. Nevertheless, it was the main port for the town since nearly all communications with the outside world was done through this port. Although Passage Fort had some form of defense system, they were subjected to frequent attacks from the European rivals and that was due to the fact that Jamaica was poorly defended by the Spanish at that time. If you like this video and you're from Portmore, give this video a thumbs up. Attacks on Passage Fort In January 1597, an English adventurer named Sir Anthony Shirley made the first real attack on Jamaica. From Passage Fort, he and approximately 250 men marched into Spanish town where they plundered the city, then set fire to it. Their invasion was short-lived, however, for they left the island shortly afterwards. A few years later, there was another attack by English General Christopher Newport. With about a dozen ships under his command, he headed for Passage Fort. There, the English attack was repelled when they were fired upon by the expectant Spanish. Portmore under the English there was to be more attacks on Jamaica by the English, for unlike previous attacks, this one was to be their last. The English set out with determination, their intention was capturing Jamaica from the Spanish, and they disembarked on the May 10, 1655 at Passage Fort in a ruthless invasion. The English captured Jamaica from the Spanish, thus ending over 150 years of Spanish occupation on the island. Development Having captured Jamaica from the Spanish, the English set out to distribute land and establish agricultural districts or settlements. The Portmore area, being a part of the Spanish town's environs, was one of the first places to be settled. By the 1700s, Portmore had a number of pens, namely Reed's Pen, Salt Pond Pen, and Cumberland Pen. Pens were small estates whose main purpose was to supply goods to larger estates. 
it was determined that, that the Portmore area was far too dry for sugar production, so pen keeping was seen as a preferred option. Port Anderson The earthquake that destroyed Port Royal in 1692 had also a devastating impact on the port, so the importance of passage fort to the English started to decline. It was also decided that the Portmore area was in need of a better port, for the harbour was often blocked with silt from the Ryacobo River. For this reason, in the mid-1700s, a new town was established approximately three miles from Passage Fort. This new town was first named New Brighton, though it eventually came to be known as Port Anderson. Port Anderson was named after Colonel John Anderson of the militia, who was responsible for its development. The new town of Port Anderson became an important town for the English. The depth of the water in this new port allowed for vessels to be anchored much closer to the wharf. Anderson built warehouses and shops from which he was paid wharfage fees and port charges. Under his ownership, a mineral spring was discovered and he cut a channel through the inside so that the waters of the spring could be distributed to the rest of the town and for a short while, this was considered a form of tourism for Port Anderson. It became a fashionable spa and health resort with a small bathhouse erected over the springs. This venture did not continue for a very long, however, as the underground water source soon shifted. Nevertheless, it is noted that in the mid-18th century, Port Anderson had become the principal port for a Spanish town. By the 1770s, it has also become a vital part of Jamaica's defense system as Portmore played a major role in the fortification of St. Catherine, or Jamaica on a whole. Fort Augusta and Fort Clarence were also pivotal in their role on the island. Nevertheless, the importance of Port Anderson fluctuated when with the dawning of the 1840s, the introduction of the railway saw a slight decline, but picked up again in the 1890s with the work of Ralph Hodgkins and the advent of Port Anderson as a banana pier. Agriculture Banana During the 1880s, banana export had become a booming business from the port. In the southeastern section of St. Catherine, major irrigation works had begun in an effort to make the plains more productive. During that period, steamships were regular visitors to the ports and the piers of the island buying tropical fruit to take back to America to satisfy the demand. The profitability of the banana venture was so great that the grazing properties in close proximity to Port Anderson were put to use by those with capital to develop banana estates with the required irrigation that goes with such a venture. The United Fruit Company, the major banana company at the time, also invested in banana production in Jamaica by buying lands all around the area, including Portmore Pen, which was north of Port Anderson. Over time, through the development of the banana industry at the turn of the 20th century, Port Anderson was firmly established as a banana pier for southeast St. Catherine. The birth and the development of modern Portmore The majority of modern Portmore was built on that coastal property called Portmore Pen. The first English owners of the property were the Dawkins family. Initially, the property was called Salt Pond Pen and was sometimes referred to as Dawkins Pen. In the second half of the 19th century, however, it was renamed Portmore Pen and then Portmore in honor of the ancestors of the Dawkins who had married into the family of the Earl of Portmore who was from Scotland. Portmore or Portmore Pen at the time did not include areas such as Brayton, Elsha, Port Anderson and the Newlands. In the early 20th century, Colonel Dawkins sold many of his Jamaican properties, Portmore included. The United Fruit Company acquired the lands from Dawkins, but did not fully utilize all of the lands. Only the northern reaches were utilized. The majority of the land remained a grassy, muddy wasteland. In the middle of the 20th century, the United Fruit Company sold the Portmore property to the Caymanas Estates. Unfortunately, much like previous owners, the lands were not fully exploited and as a result, much of Portmore remained undeveloped. Consequently, a company called the Portmore Land Development Company was formed and they purchased the property from the Caymanas Estate, 
with the intention of establishing a housing development on the property. In the 1950s and the 60s, Kingston ran out of suitable lands for development. Therefore, housing development in Portmore was a response to the great outcry for affordable housing of sections of the population. Prior to any development of the land, a dike had to be constructed to contain the Raya Cobra and a causeway built to connect Kingston to Portmore. The lowlands and the arbor were also dredged and filled with quarried marl stones from the Port Anderson Hills. Once this was successfully accomplished, housing development began in earnest. Housing Development In 1969, under the direction of the West Indies Home Contractors, or WICON, the first housing scheme in Portmore was erected and was called Independence City. The scheme consisted of approximately 1,000 to 1,200 two- and three-bedroom dwellings. The following housing community to be constructed was Edgewater Villas. Over time, more community development followed. Bridgeport Phase 1 and 2 came next in 1972 and 1974 respectively. This was followed by Passage Fort in the same year and Waterford a year later in 1975. Bridgeport Phase 3 followed in 1976 with the construction of Portsmouth and the South Borough in 1978 and 1979. Population With the development of Portmore came a growth in its population. When developers started working in the late 1960s, it is said that fewer than 2,000 people were living in the Portmore area. By 1970, there was a sharp increase of about 5,000 people. In the 1980s, more housing schemes were constructed. Cumberland, Westchester, and West Bay Phase 1 and 2 were erected. During this period, it is estimated that approximately 77,000 people were living in Portmore. The beginning of the 1990s saw the construction of West Bay Phase 3 and Bridgeview, with an increase of units at Cumberland. This contributed to additional growth in the already booming population. With the construction of Greater Portmore in the mid-1990s came another escalation in population and the number of residents in Portmore almost doubled to roughly 160,000. Along with the various development schemes came schools, a town centre, churches and other essential facilities. As a result of the rapid development, a bill was passed granting Portmore a municipal status in 2003. They were given the right to manage their own affairs, including election of their own mayor. By far, the most considerable aspect of the development in Portmore is its status as the largest residential area in the Caribbean, with over 200,000 residents. Notable places are buildings in Portmore. Fort Augusta Situated between Port Anderson and the Passage Fort on the seaward side is Fort Augusta. Construction of this fort began in 1740 and was completed in the 1750s. Fort Augusta was named in honor of the mother of King George III. The fort was part of the island's defense system and by 1770 up to 80 guns were positioned there. Fort Augusta has been converted into a correctional facility for women and is the only one of its kind on the island. I think it closed. I'm not sure. That is for another video. Two Sisters Cave Located in the Elsher Hills, each cave has a large sinkhole, which contains fresh water. It is possible that these reservoirs served as sources of fresh water for the Taino people. The cave contains a petroglyph or a prehistoric rock drawing of a face, which is believed to be about 700 years old. Rodney's Lookout Built by Admiral George Rodney on a summit of the Port Anderson Hills between 1780 to 1782 as a signaling station. Guys, if you found this video interesting or informative, please leave a comment down below or subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so before. And remember, I always accept a thumbs up. Thanks for watching.